The two men walked slowly toward one another, both wearing bodies well worn by eight decades of life and one carrying the trauma of cancer. They greeted each other like this, one bowed low, and then the other opened his arms wide. They embraced closely, and then they stood back, still touching one another's shoulders, still embracing, but this time with their eyes. One reached out and touched the other's cheek, and with his hand there looked at him and said, you look good. The other puckered his lips as if to blow a kiss. And then the first took his chin in his hand and moved to kiss the other one puckering on his cheek. The other, unaccustomed actually to kisses from anyone, flinched, and then they both laughed. They laughed together, they took one another's hands, and they walked off, hoping to change the world. Today, I invite you to listen to their message in hopes that we may help them in some part achieve that goal. We may consider it a belated birthday present. You see, the setting of this, count, this encounter was Dharamsala, India, where the Dalai Lama resides in exile, exile from his country, Tibet. The two men, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and his dear friend, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. The Dalai Lama is the spiritual leader of the Tibetan people and Buddhists. Desmond Tutu is the retired Archbishop of Cape Town, South Africa and Christian. The event was the 80th birthday of His Holiness. Notable, the fact that he, His Holiness, was unable to join the Archbishop in South Africa for his 80th. The South African government has repeatedly denied him visas to enter their country, even for the occasion of the Archbishop's birthday, even on the occasion of the World Summit of Nobel Peace Laureates, of which he is one, actually both of them are. The reason for this exclusion is said to be the fear of angering the Chinese government. In 1959, the Chinese government destroyed nearly all Tibetan monasteries, attempting to annihilate Tibetan Buddhism. India, we're a complicated world. India welcomed the Dalai Lama into sanctuary and authorized the creation of Tibetan Buddhism in exile. In doing so, not only has this gentle religion that focuses on oneness and compassion survived in exile, it even remains strong in China today. And so they both met. The archbishop traveling at expense to his body due to illness, but determined to meet his friend to talk about joy and to honor their birthdays with a gift to all of us. Some might say the gift was the marvelous book they wrote. It's called The Book of Joy, Lasting Happiness in a Changing World. And it's good, it's very, very good. It was the intended product of the week that they spent together following the greeting that I've just described. They wrote it in collaboration with Douglas Abrams, who interviewed them throughout the week, creating a rich tapestry of their voices and their views and offering some of his own very wonderful commentary. Their shared thesis was that we all have the power, we all have the power to create more joy. That lasting happiness isn't tied to anything or even any goal. And that it's intrinsically tried, tied to striving to make joy possible for others that it's found inside of our heads and our hearts, and their message should find a home here, not simply because it's about love. That's a good reason and a good fit, isn't it? But because they say, you don't have to believe us. Indeed, nothing we say should be taken as an article of faith. And that also finds a good fit in Unitarian Universalism. You don't have to believe us. They challenge us to take whatever they offer and frankly, to give it a go. And what they offer is having identified eight pillars of joy, four of the mind and four of the heart, along with practices to hone them all. But do you know when you get a gift, Christmas or another holiday, birthday, and 
You really like it, but what really grabs you is how much thought went into the giving, that the person who gave it to you knows you so well or had paid attention so well that it was perfect, that it didn't really even matter how much it cost or even if it fit or was the right color because the thought was so beautiful and so clear. Or alternatively, somebody gave you more than one gift thinking you'd really like the big shiny one, but it's the little one that captivates you entirely or maybe the wrapping paper. Instead of that new electronic whatever you wanted, it's the Star Wars socks that rock your world. Well, friends, reading this book was sort of like that for me. It's really, really good. It's so good, I'm going to announce a special spirit circle session open to all just to read that book and talk a whole lot about it. But what grabbed me for a moment well, was something different. It was something else. It was the relationship. It was and it remains remarkable. The friendship between these two people, the friendship that they chose to create, is a beautiful, beautiful model. Not just of their face in life, but of daring to cross cultural divides, put aside assumptions, and achieve change in ourselves and through that, the world. Here in the shadow of the Himalayas, these two elders walked away from the airport to begin their week together, holding hands and laughing. In some ways, the two could not be much more different. One believes in a life after death that will have him joining God in heaven. The other believes in reincarnation himself the reincarnation of a past Dalai Lama who chose him to continue his work. One grew up with his family during apartheid in South Africa, hoping to become a doctor, but because his family was poor and could not afford his studies, he became a teacher and later a priest, and then the first black man to hold the position of Bishop of Johannesburg and then Archbishop of Cape Town. He was one of South Africa's leading anti-apartheid activists. The other was identified as the reincarnation of the previous Dalai Lama as a preschooler, placed in a monastery at age five, trained by the highest monks in the land, enthroned at age 15, and forced into exile to save his life and his religion a decade later. He would become known all over the world for his commitment to compassion, nonviolent resistance, and interfaith dialogue. They also have very different laughs. Tutu is known for his laugh, and if you have not ever heard it, I encourage you to just go Google Tutu laugh. It's one of those laughs that makes you laugh. I will be shocked if that doesn't happen to you. That's my testimony today. You just, it's making me, it's happening to me right now. You just can't help it. He gets going and can't stop, and you cannot help yourself from joining in. If you need a laugh, again, just Google Tutu and laugh. His holiness, on the other hand, has what someone described as more of a Buddhist laugh if such a thing existed. Both dedicate themselves, they dedicated themselves to one another in a manner that was clear to any who witnessed it. Both authentic, both leaning in with curiosity, both humble, and both caring of the other and about the world. So let me share just a bit about what they meant by the pillars of joy before I focus on the gift of the relationship. Their baseline belief is that joy is a birthright. Joy is a birthright. And when they speak of joy, they aren't talking about the kind of joy that you get when you get those Star Wars socks or electronics, or the kind of joy you get when you take a bite of your favorite food, or, or you get a good grade, or a raise, or complete a project. These two remarkable human beings, reflecting back on decades of religious leadership, are speaking to us about a joy that is only achievable through seeking joy for another person. Lasting happiness does not reside in fortune and fame, 
Um, do, do, do. But in our heads and in our hearts, and it is tied to that deep joy, and achieving that is our, within our power. The eight pillars that they identified are perspective, humility, humor, acceptance, forgiveness, gratitude, compassion, and generosity. Perspective, in order to have empathy, we need to take what Tutu called a God's eye perspective, and regardless of your theology, it's a useful image, isn't it? Living in the land of I is a recipe, they say, for anger and frustration. We need to live in the land of we, all of us. Humility. They suggest we practice this line. Whenever I see someone, may I never feel superior. It's easy to read, harder to live, isn't it? But remember, we practice because we know that each of us is beautiful, flawed, and worthy. Humor. I've shared a little bit of theirs with you. It connects us by providing respite, certainly, but also it is a way for them to share and bridge emotions. Acceptance. His Holiness put it this way. Why? Why be unhappy about something that can't be remedied? Again, an easy sentence to read, more difficult to live. Forgiveness is the next. The two spiritual guides remind us that holding on and leaving space for anger and grief or any wish for vengeance hurts us and possibly others that we don't intend it to hurt. They do not suggest forgetting, but forgiving and undoing